I believe it was back in 19, uh, or in 2007, perhaps, or six, uh, I was in London, and uh, uh, during my trip, I was researching uh, what would later be published as the English translation of uh, George von Welling's uh, Opus Cabalisticum uh, Philosophicum Magicum. Uh, well, anyway, an old alchemical text. And I wanted to ch uh, check uh, what I was using against the uh, 1749 edition that uh, the British Library had uh, uh, several copies of. Uh, I especially wanted to see the hand-colored uh, uh, plates uh, in it. But anyway, you just can't go to the British Library without credentials and so I had to uh, I had to prove up that I was a, a legitimate scholar which uh, you know I'm not but I talked my way into it and I got this beautiful British Library uh, credentials that was good through through uh, May 2008 and I just ran across this this ran across this uh, while going through some things this morning. I thought I'd show you that because what else am I going to have to sh share that? Anyway, we're on the second to the last uh, uh, part of the section on Kabbalah Zen of the West in our daily readings of Angels, Demons, and Gods of the New Millennium, Musings on Modern Magic. So we're at the little section where we're talking about the games Kabbalists play, uh, Gematria, Noterakon, and Tamura. And today uh, we're going to start with Tamura, but then we're going to move on to a very interesting section called What's in a Name? And we'll talk about yod heh vav -Hey then. Remember, this was written, uh, or it was published in, 2000, in uh, 19... 97, and many of the the parts of it were written uh, even earlier. So if you uh, run into things that you disagree with, uh, remember you're disagreeing with a, a very young Lon Milo Duquette. Tamura cryptographically substitutes one letter with another. There are literally thousands of ways this method can be applied. And it appears that Kabbalists have tried all of them. One popular method entails folding the alphabet upon itself, forming two rows of 11 letters, sort of thusly. A letter from the top row simply substituted for the letter directly beneath it and vice versa. This version of Tamura is called at bush. Okay. Uh, after the first four letters in the code. So in other words, the uh, the type of Tamura it is is based on at shubu those letters right here at the far, far left, the first four of those. This version of Tamura is called A-T-B-S-H, or A-T-H-B-S-H. Yeah. After the first four letters in the code. We were talking about the word blood yesterday, D-M, or Daleth Mem. Blood would now be spelled Q-I. And that word in Hebrew is the root of to vomit. Oops. Which enumerates to 101, as do the Hebrew words for storehouse and kingdom and virgin princess. 
by replacing the first letter of the lower row and shifting the remaining letters to the right, new combinations are formed. In the following example, L has now been taken from the far left position of the lower row and placed in the far right position. This version of Tamora would be designated AL BTH. So, like AL BTH. D DM or blood is now RK. In Hebrew, RK means soft, timid, delicate. But in England, uh, excuse me, in English, I told you puns would not be off limits. It's the phonetic spelling of the word ark. Whether we're referring to Noah's Ark or the Ark of the Covenant, no symbol for the life-transporting, life-sustaining blood can be more profound than the word Ark. In Hebrew, RK adds to 220, the same as the words uh, in Hebrew for the elect and a rich lady. Also, the sum of the letters that make up the phrase Ye shall cling, cleave unto Jehovah. When we use the above chart to examine the word beret sheet in the beginning, the first word of Genesis, we get the letters T H D T H B M A. To my knowledge, there is no such word in Hebrew. But if we examine each letter, T H is a seal. D, a door, TH, a seal, B, a house, and M, water, A, creative energy. And use a little Kabbalistic imagination, we might come up with a poetic description of pre-Big Bang cosmology. In the beginning, the source of creative energy of life was sealed in a house whose door was locked on both sides. The most popular method of Tamora has the romantic title of the Kabbalah of the Nine Chambers. And there's a, there's a, a view of the Kabbalah of the Nine Chambers right there. It's based on the decimal scale and links all letters representing single digit numbers with their double and triple digit relatives. In example, A can be substituted for Y, or A number one can be substituted for Y number 10, or Q number 100. Using the Kabbalah of the Nine Chambers, both letters of DM are found in the same chamber, because D is 4 and M is 40. So the only other letter to substitute for either of those letters would be TH, which is 400, a mark, signature, seal. And with this signature, sealed in blood, we come to a poetic end to our brief excursion into Tamora. Wasn't that clever? Okay, what's in a name? As I mentioned earlier, Kabbalists maintain that all things in heaven and earth are expressions of the divine letter numbers and vice versa. Consequently, everything is an energy-filled component of an immensely vast divine being, and every word or name reveals the formula by which that component discharges its office. The greater the component's responsibility in the grand scheme of things, the more profound and powerful its number, letter, name. It follows that the 
most potent and significant words would be the names of the deity itself. God is referred to by many names in the Bible. When translated into English, these variations are given vague appellations such as God, Lord, Lord God, God Almighty, and a number of other ambiguous titles which succeed quite effectively in annihilating any spiritual meaning a would-be mystic might glean from the word. For instance, the God who created the heavens and earth in Genesis 1-1 is Elohim, a masculine plural of a feminine word, Eloah. A more accurate translation of the above would be, in the beginning, the gods and goddesses created the heavens and the earth. I certainly would have appreciated knowing that tidbit of information back in Methodist Youth Fellowship, when the youth leader was guileless enough to teach a room full of adolescents that God was male, and he created all things by means of his male power. Quote, male power. If God is everywhere, came my predictable retort, where could he stick his male power? I was always in trouble. Oh, well, anyway. The supreme Kabbalistic name of God is the ineffable four-letter word spelled yod Hey vav Hey, pronounced Jehovah by the profane and referred to in Kabbalistic literature as the Tetragrammaton. All creation from the highest heaven to the lowest hell is a projection issuing from this deity. The individual letters of the Tetragrammaton represent the four most fundamental aspects of creation. All matter, energy, and consciousness <clears throat> can be categorized under these four headings. This fourfold division is depicted as four descending worlds, Atzalith, Briya, Yetzira, and Asaya through which the will of deity is transmitted down to the material plane via a Byzantine chain of command and a hierarchy of divine names, archangels, angels, and spirits. Now, if it tickles your sense of wonder to think of this celestial pecking order as objective beings with halos and feathers, who live their lives and discharge their duties like, a, like heavenly stockbrokers, that's perfectly fine. In fact, this is precisely the attitude of the ceremonial magician who plies his or her craft by transforming subjective abstractions into objective realities. Nevertheless, when we talk about divine names or angels or archangels, we're really talking about an ordered hierarchy of natural energies and forces. For example, we could say that the law of gravity is a great archangel whose dominion throughout the cosmos is unimaginably universal. The archangel gravity rules a host of angels residing in the next lower world who can only function within the strict disciplines of the law of gravity and who are responsible for more specific gravitational duties. Now, here's a footnote. Angels under the rulership of the archangel gravity might have names like attract, pull, tug, 
They all work for Gravity AL. Okay, some angels might cause stars in the galaxies to revolve around a central point or, or be responsible for the unique behavior of black holes. Under the jurisdiction of each angel and residing in the lowest of the four Kabbalistic worlds are the countless intelligences and spirits. Now, here's a footnote. Spirits and intelligences under the rulership of angels might be called attract, pull, or tug. And they might have names like drop, fall, tumble, sag, droop, slip, slide, decay, descend, succumb, decline, regress, swag, dip, incline, settle, sink, plunge, or plummet. Plummet ale. These are the cosmic detail men of the phenomenal universe who execute the most specific jobs from ocean tides and the falling of apples to determining the winner of the soapbox derby. If you're too young to remember a soapbox derby, it was just gliding cars that little kids made and raced each other down a hill with. The only power was gravity. The fundamental theory underlying traditional Kabbalistic magic maintains that if you can identify and petition the correct aspect of deity, which would be the divine name in Adsalith, you can then make appeal to the correct archangel, who would be in Briya, to direct the correct angel, who would be in Yetzirah, to allow you to order the correct spirit, and that's in Asaya, the material world, the lowest world, to do your bidding. This cosmic name dropping may seem rather primitive and superstitious, but it's an excellent way to train our minds to constantly be aware of a greater reality behind all we perceive. And here we split it in the, uh, we look at the Tetragrammaton letter by letter for just briefly. Yod, that's the highest one. And the Tetragrammaton remembers Yod, He, Vav, He. So Yod would be the highest world, Atzalith. It's the archetypal world where the male and female aspects of deity are still united in bliss and the three worlds below Adzilleth are the fruit of this union. Hey, the next world is Briah, the creative world, the world of archangels, where the various aspects of the creative will begin to organize into agencies with broad powers and responsibilities, like the archangel Gravity Hail. That's, that's uh, uh, broad powers and responsibilities of the force of gravity. Vav, the next level is Yetzira, the formative world, the world of the angel hosts. Here the general orders of the archangels are drawn up in specific detail for eventual manifestation in the lowest world, Hey. Asiya, or Asaya, the world of matter, the phenomenal universe, the world of planetary intelligences, spirits of the elements, and human beings. A material object such as a chair manifests in Asaya, right here. I'm sitting in, I've got my ass in the Asaya chair right now. But it has its non-material blueprint, the image of a specific chair, in yet Zyra. And a universally organized conception, I mean, very generalized conception of the theory of sitting 
and chair. And that's way up in the archangelic realm of Briya. So chair in Isaiah, blueprint for a chair in yet Zyra, and the idea of uh, sitting your ass in a, in a chair, just the idea of that, not even a specific image of it, would be up in Briya. And that's the archangel level. Okay, and the supreme abstract model is just simply the idea of rest. And that rest idea is way up in Atzilith, the archetypal world. If this scenario sounds familiar, it's because Plato, who is said to have studied the wisdom of the ancient Hebrews, postulated these archetypal worlds in his ninth book of the Republic. Predictably, there are hundreds of ways Kabbalists have dissected and itemized the inhabitants of the various worlds. The most familiar has for its model the Tree of Life. Each of the four Kabbalistic worlds is pictured as its own Tree of Life. And that's why in my my pentacle is those four trees of life all joined, uh, all their kethers or all their number ones are joined right at the center. Or you could view them sitting right on top of each other. Or you could superimpose them one on top of the other just like in the image that I showed, that I posted this morning. See, there's actually four of those worlds, one on top of the other, and I've got their various names and, and things uh, all written on the top one there. Each of the four Kabbalistic worlds is pictured as its own tree of life, and when all four are superimposed upon each other, just like in that figure, we can see exactly who is the boss in the fourfold hierarchy of each of the ten subdivisions of the tree. So, keeping that in mind, if you um, just scroll down, uh, I think just one little section, and find that illustration, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, remember what I said uh, at the very beginning, that the first edition of uh, this book had this wonderful pull-out diagram of the angels of the Shemhamferish and how uh, they are created and uh, how they're associated with the 72... Uh, 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 periods of five degrees of the zodiac and how each of them rule a tarot card and uh, 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 72 angels of the Shemhamferish. Tomorrow's chapter will be the Shemhamferish. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we'll finish up this part of the chapter uh, tomorrow. And tomorrow we'll, we'll do chapter three about the Emerald Tablet of Hermes and the Invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel. So I hope you're enjoying Angels, Demons, and Gods of the New Millennium. And I, I hope you're buying it. <laughs> or downloading the Kindle. Do something, the, the publisher would just be thrilled. Anyway, continue to have a good week, everyone. Be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. <laughs>